Welcome to The Emergence, a podcast asking the question, what is possible when we are connected and in control? Today's episode is a conversation with a friend of my son, Vaughn, whom I've had uh, held a number of deep and rewarding conversations with over the years. Carlos Castro recently graduated with a bachelor's in history and political science from the College of Liberal Arts and Science at Arizona State University. He is now looking at potential fields of study or employment in historical research, working as a librarian or the field of law. Today's conversation is centered around the value of labor. A topic I feel is topical considering the current issues with retaining employees in the market and would love to have a fresh perspective on from today's youth as many of them will represent the actions of tomorrow. Born at the very tail end of the baby boom generation, I am very hopeful for Generation Z, whom Carlos represents. I've actually come to this conclusion through my interaction with all of Vaughn's friends, as well as the realization they are the first generation to possess a tool set to truly exercise human potential. So let me bring on Carlos Castro. Welcome to the show, Carlos. Hey, pleasure to be here. Yeah, well, thank you so much for... uh, for coming on the show. And uh, like I said, uh, you're part of uh, Vaughn's network of friends that I've always been so struck by. And and you're, everybody's intellectual curiosity is what really strikes me and is just fascinating to me. And it just seems like your generation is, uh, you you grew up with, uh, with the web and the internet and the, and the connection. So um, talk a little bit before we go into the value of labor, let's talk about today's tool set and what that means to you that the goods and the, and the, the negatives, the positives and, and the, the problems. So talk a little bit about your perspective and the lens of, of communication technology. Yeah. Well, at least from my generation where, like, as you pointed out, we're the first generation to fully be connected with the internet compared Sorry, I'm like kind of stepping over my thoughts, but uh, no, that's okay. That's okay. Like, but like relative to like gen to millennials or even Gen Xers, like their first encounter with the internet was something as basic as like using that. Well, for us, we're pretty much the smartphone generation, <laughs> yeah. and for the most part, like that's able to have more access to information. Like, I know there's one fact that I like like pointing out. Like, since 2001, we produced more information than was produced before, like in all of human history, and that comes with its benefits. It's perks, but it also comes with its drawbacks. Yes. Like on the one hand, it's a lot. Compared, I don't like. I don't know how your experience was, how hard it was to research for papers in high school or college for you, Paul. <laughs> but like for a, like my direction, it's a lo- lot easier. Like we don't have to go through. Well, I like public libraries, but you don't have to dig through it all the time. You don't have to memorize it through a decimal system. But with that benefit, there is also the problem with misinformation. You also have the problem with social media anxiety. Like the, Increase rates of depression. So it the better comes with the seat when it comes to the digital age. Yeah. And it's a, uh, but my, okay, my college paper, um, my bachelor's was written on a typewriter and whiteout. So there, oh there, there's my perspective. <laughs> yeah. And, and right at my, my graduating year from college, they brought on, they were using um, spell check and their computers. And I said, oh my God, could I have used that? <laughs> you know, yeah. it's just amazing what, and, and there's so many good things. I was actually in, in uh, uh, Sedona with uh, Vaughn and my sister. Mm-hmm. And uh, this weekend, and my sister was using an app to take pictures of of uh, flowers, so to identify flowers, to help her understand what the what the native flowers are in that area in Sedona. And she uses it for her own garden. And I thought, my God, is that just not a beautiful use of technology to help understand what surrounds her? And, and it was driving her interest. It was so she could understand and take a picture of an orchid, and she could understand the exact, uh, you know, the 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 exact type of plant that was to help her have a different perspective on, on what it was. So then maybe she could think about for her garden. And and the good side of these technologies are that is it's letting us have a better understanding beyond what nature gives us. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like better tools of analysis or just more accessibility to information that you wouldn't have had previously. Like if you, for example, that's a really good example. If you, if you wanted to learn more about plants, you probably have to check out a like on botany from the library. And like I said, li- libraries are great, but like some people, like the pre- you don't have to make a drive all that often. You can just access it with the touch of a button. 
Yeah. And, and see, that's my, my argument. I, I told this to an ASU professor and she just did not like it, but na- nature has limitations. So I, I could actually, I'm, heck, I'm talking to you and you're not in my house and we're having the ability to have a deep and interesting conversation, but nature would restrict us to being able to have this conversation. If you lived in India, if you lived in, in Nebraska and it's that core. So these, these are the positive sides and, and really this, all of this speaks to the value of labor because at its core, it's, it enables the positive side enables the expression of labor that nature has limited, you know, you know, historically, you know, you go work on the, on the, um, on the slave ships and, and your job is to row the ship. And, you know, we don't have to, all of us don't have to express our labor in such manual and, and such ways that demand such physicality. Now, some of us do, and, you know, some, some people like to work on cars. They just love to work on cars. They're mechanically inclined. They like to get dirty. That's great. That's their expression of labor. Uh, but with this, when we talk about the positive side of the tool sets of this connection, like my sister taking a picture of a flower, what could that do for a true expression of labor that is not limited by nature? It's augmented, it's helped. And so I'm kind of, I, I want to really dig deep into this. So I didn't want to go too deep uh, right up front, but mm-hmm. it's this, it's, the positive side. Let's let's focus on the positive side of what technology could bring to breaking that barrier of the limitations of of the expressions of labor. Of how yeah. how uh, what do you what do you think on that? What are your well, thoughts? Well, like I said, you made a point out a really good example with being able to talk to somebody from India. Like you essentially flat. Like there's a good book by Thomas Friedman. Like flat. The world is flat. Not literally, obviously. Yes. But, but yeah. But the point, like we're reducing communication costs. Like. Travel cost. It gets. It works around travel costs. Like you don't have to pay if you're someone in India. You don't have to pay seven hundred or whatever it costs like to move to the United States. Sorry. With labor, you don't have to be able to. It's. We both know how expensive it is to move to, like to a different state or to a different area. Like, like a that's like one inhibition that comes that comes to a lot of people who want to start new career opportunities. But with working from home, with telecommunications advances, it's possible to teleconference into wherever you want <laughs> like that's like an that's a really great innovate one of the best innovations of the last 20 30 years absolutely the zoom i mean heck we're, we're using zoom to have a conversation and uh, uh there's there's this thing so we're, we're going through a really weird correction now and this is why it struck me about wanting to talk to you about this because i, I wanted mm-hmm. the gen z perspective on this is that everywhere that i go restaurants uh, our work, our, um, I work at a motorcycle um, dealership and Kawasaki is having problems being able to deliver units for us, motorcycles and side-by-sides to sell because the dock workers are having a problem. Um, you know, the managers of the docks are having problem with labor and, and it's all around restaurants everywhere. People are having a print shop that I work with is having a problem being able to bring people on and retain them. So there's this thing that's going on that I think is more significant than it's ever been historically to where people are kind of taking charge of their own labor, their own expression of labor. And I don't know what they're doing. They, you know, we do have unemployment that is still running uh, though, those subsidies that's going to be ending soon. But I, I wonder if it's beyond that. The the fact of our people, I, I'd seen a couple of things on the web where people are leaving these uh, restaurants, you know, the McDonald's and Burger Kings and saying that, you know, welcome to the revolution to where in mass <laughs> they're quitting. And, you know, people can say, well, you know, we'll hire somebody else. But the problem is there's not enough people that want to work. So, first of all, where are they going? And then second of all, what is that dynamic with COVID and, and remote being able to choose your labor more? Uh, you have more control over choosing your labor. You can go and work and, and do Instacart, you know, talk a little bit about that, of the choices yeah. that we have in our expressions of labor. Like people are realizing that they have more choices than they had before. And I think one thing that the whole COVID crisis of the last year is I like how, like how, like the amount of I use bad language or. No, 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 it's fine. Let's do it. Yeah, like a lot of service workers are realizing how shit they're treated by their managers, by their employers. You know, like for example, like as much as we talk about the benefits of working from home, like like after we both have to realize it's mostly those dividends have been for like upper middle class people or college educators for a lot of people who 
work in the service sector who barely have high school degrees or any even GEDs. Like it's like it's not that good. Like they need and a lot of people these are the people who've like gotten the most infections, have been hospitalized more or have even died more. <laughs> like like they're realizing like they have more leverage now. And like they, they sh- and like this is my opinion, like that they, they should use it more. Like why shouldn't they fight for higher wages? Like for better protections, you know, more health insurance. I mean, like a lot of like small business owners have been tried and found wanting by the whole crisis. Yes. And, like younger people, like my generation, like we just don't want to take that. Well, and I know, and that, that is part of this. Uh, I, I refer to it as the awakening as opposed to the revolution, but people have their own labeling and choose their own words. But you know, on the other side of that, then uh, let's, let's exercise that other side. So restaurants, we still need to eat. So if, if the labor doesn't work at the restaurants and we're not quite there where we're having the, the bipedal robots serving us burgers, we're not quite there yet. I know it's starting, um, but for the next 10 to 15 years, we still really at the core, a lot of these positions, we need physical labor. So whenever we don't have enough labor to fulfill these positions and the rates that, and the, and the, the labor rates go so high the argument is going to be that that they're going to have to charge us more for burgers and for motorcycles and for shirts. So where does that end? I mean, where, where, where are we going with that? I, I know you like to argue on the people side, which I do too, but I always like to have a balance of provider and people mm-hmm. to where, because I, I never like it to go too far one way. It just makes me uncomfortable because of even the idea of revolution is just that a lot of times it ends up with just certain parties just being in control and everybody else suffering like they did before. Yeah, like so, you know, a whole rubs, rubs here. Dynamic. Yeah. So where are we going with this? Where, where, what are your views on the, on the provider side? Do you have any empathy for a business owner on this? What the struggles they're going to have to deal with? I'm sure there are like, like a lot of good business owners out there, but for the most part, you have, you have like some who just don't like engage in wage theft or, or just for the negligent. I think for the most part, a lot of small businesses aren't going to pull through like the current crisis. I mean, like, like, look at Amazon. Amazon's taken up a bigger share of like the like online purchases, like lately, fifty-seven like, percent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all like, online purchases. Like the like the retail. Like we're both familiar. We've both seen like the results of the retail apocalypse in real life. Like, go to Arrowhead Mall. Like a lot of shops are, like a lot of the shops that we've known for like the past ten years, gone. Boop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so we're going to see probably more consolidation in the Amazon business. But if I'm being honest, I don't see that as too much of a bad thing. I. Like I've talked to Vaughn about this earlier. I don't know if he's mentioned it to you, but I think people fetishize like the idea of like small businesses too much, like and kind of ignore like the nastier sides of it. Yeah. So, uh, well, and see, my thing is, I it's not, and I've, I believe me, Vaughn go and I go toe to toe on these things. We were just arguing coming down from Sedona. We go full throttle, and it's great. I love it. That's I love this kind of debate. Yeah, it's sweet, by the way. It, oh, okay. And I, I love the, but, but let's, let's, let's break this down is that I know that we've kind of had the fantasy of, of small business because to some degree, there can be the same problems with small business as there are with, with big business and the way that they treat labor. And I agree with that. And I've, I've worked in small business and big business. I, I work at a place right now where I, I do believe that I'm, I'm valued, uh, but I've been in places before. So, but, but there's something with big business, like Amazon owning 57% of all online searches has changed the dynamic. And to me, I want to build, I want to fight for a better future where small business is rewarded, but on the same point, they work for that reward because they're also rewarding labor. That's why I like the idea of worker co-op. So I, I believe that moving forward, these small businesses that should be more of a partnership with labor than a dictatorship of labor, because that really is what it is, is that capitalism more or less ends up being to where it's not a democracy. Labor is not living in a democracy in Western civiliza- uh, civilization. So, uh so I, I love small business, but I also like a small business that is using the potential of an expression of the true value of labor, not for as a widget, but as a person and they value it. So uh, you just sent me a link, you said? Yeah. Like, because uh, the first style like, in the link is like, like wages with fir- like firms with over a thousand employees, like pay them more, pay their workers more than wages than, than, than firms with like less than like six to nine employees. 
Yeah, well, but that's also they're also receiving pressure in competition from bigger companies, so they're having to watch their margins more than big. And, and, and here's the thing: Amazon doesn't have to pay the level of taxes that a small business does. So because they have teams of accountants and lawyers that are able to then get around these taxes. So their margins of profit are a lot different than bigger corporations. So they are going to have more pressures on their uh, their wages than a big corporation. Do you agree with that? Or let's talk about that. Yeah, I think they do. But at the same time, yeah. Sorry, I'm getting one of my thoughts together. But yeah, but they're all, but you also have to consider the issue of like labor type protections as well. Like if you scroll down further, like some like small bodies are excluded from labor protections and from the U.S. labor code. Where did you send that link to? I don't. Uh... Oh, it's on the Zoom chat. Oh, geez, I'm sorry. I'm not yeah. even looking in there. Okay, I haven't even used Zoom chat yet. Look at that. So, for example, for one protection from the uh, Civil Rights Act, racial discrimination sits for 15 plus employees. You have to have 50 plus stories for family and medical leave. You have to have over 50 employees. Yes. Well, yes. And, and, and believe me, there are quite a bit of, uh, well, really the, the issue that I believe we're facing is, is competition is a, is a major issue. And then actually the, uh, um, Lena Khan, who is the new FTC, um, commissioner, uh, head of the FTC uh, wrote a really pretty hardcore paper on Amazon um, a, f- a few years ago. And I do believe that she is going to be one that is going to take on Amazon and Facebook and the Googles in a different light than her predecessors. Oh, yeah. And- no, she's a, what's what's it called? Like a Neo Brandeisian? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like we're like to the point, like we're, the fact that a business is even big is like one reason like to de- knock it down a pig. It's, I can, I can, I sympathize with, you know, especially with Facebook and Twitter. Well, and that's, okay. So the thing is, is do we, to be able to, uh, to explore the value of labor, which really is, that's why I'm choosing those words. Is it because mm-hmm. it's at the bottom line of it is that I have abilities and I have potential. I personally don't think my potential is even anywhere close to, um, taken advantage of even in my current workplace, even though I love my, the owners and, and everything, but, but that the system capitalism, but again, I, I, I don't, I'm not arguing for communism. I'm, I'm not even arguing for any isms. <laughs> I'm arguing for a marketplace, a true free market. Cause we're living in an influenced market. We're not oh, living yeah. in a, there's, in a free market. There's like a lot of aspects that are captured, like the parts of our economy that are essentially captured. Like you also have captured institutions. Well, like yeah. Is, because like one issue like I've talked to you about before, like housing, for example, like with, yes, like we we both like you know what the acronym NIMBY means, right? Of what? What was that word you said? Um, NIMBY. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, like NIM, like NIMBYs, for example, like it's not even like a business, like it's not even so much business as it is like landed interest, like people, property owners who want to protect the like the value of their house, like housing. And for the and audience, we, what's NIMBY again? And not in my backyard. Oh so yeah, you're, yeah, so, you're yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, for somebody who says no, like, you're just, maybe these are people who don't want to build, like, any new housing built near, or anything really built nearby them. Like, whether it's, like, a, say, like, a high-rise apartment, or if it's a homeless shelter, or rehab, anything like that. Nope. I think there's a really funny George Carlin skit <laughs> that I'll probably post in the Zoom chat for you, Paul. But, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, no. So, like, this is, like, for, I mean, I know this is kind of a weird digression, but it's still interesting nonetheless. But, um, yeah, like, like there are groups that sponsor regulations that block construction of new housing. For example, in California, you can't have housing that's over a certain height. You can't have duplexes in certain neighborhoods. You have zoning laws that stipulate that you can only build single family housing. Like that's, can either, that's sometimes one story or just two stories, but nope, like that's it. And that's, especially here in Phoenix, that like that's what's causing all this urban sprawl to have been built. Yes. And we're going to, I want to bring you on the show in the future and talk about uh, city planning because uh, that was the one I wanted to talk to you about, but my brain has been around labor because I'm going to do a worker (laughs) co-op show coming up. I've got a guy, an ASU professor that I'm going to talk to uh, in a couple of weeks on worker co-op. So I I just, I'm really in my mindset right now is in, in labor, but it really does, when you're talking about the housing, you know, what's going on in Silicon Valley is just insane. Oh yeah. Like San Francisco is like, 
like, yes, like one and, of the worst cities in like California in general, is like the bellwether for housing. Yeah, because like, and then you have you created a place for labor, but labor can't afford to live in the community right. of where labor is being expressed. Like labor has to li- live further and further away from the center. So you can't live in the center of the 6A San Jose. You have to move further and further out into the suburbs. <laughs> like, and it causes even worse issues. Like, yeah, like, you have gentrification. It, you got like, like the long commute, like you, you drive your car longer, more, you pump more carbon dioxide into the air yep. and that contributes to climate change. Like all these issues are really interconnected. Yes. And that's why we saw during COVID that there was a de- decrease in, in uh, pollution Emission. because of the redistribution of how labor has been, has been consumed. Yeah. Like it said, that's like one dividend, like from the work from home, <laughs> I guess you call it the revolution. Although I know like there are some employers who want to roll it back. I know one prominent empl- like CEO that I read about last night was a uh, Reed Hastings, like Reed Hastings, the Netflix CEO. Oh, Netflix. Like, he, yes. Yeah. He wants, it's, which is kind of interesting. He doesn't even, oh, he doesn't have his own now. Reed Hastings doesn't even have his own office, but he wants to roll it back. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. Let's really kind of uh, thread on this is that what this whole thing about remote telecommuting, it was, I, I remember this when I think it was Marissa Mayer with Yahoo that she started out and they made this big Bollywood about the fact that she was going to be this revolutionary uh, CEO of Yahoo and she was going to empower women and empower labor. And the first thing she did, she took away telecommunication um, uh, capabilities, <laughs> remote workers, and she telecommuted herself for her child <laughs> so oh, that really? she could take care of her <laughs> child remotely. And, uh, you know, it's it's the and I know that uh, Facebook wants to do it. But but here's the thing. I think this is where the cat is out of the bag. And I believe remote working is better for society because then people are going to work in the communities of where they live. So our communities will start to be built around the necessities of grocery stores and and play and sports and parks and things that really service. Because when people have to drive, I drive an hour to work there and then an hour back. You know, I'm not living in the community of where I'm working. So if people start to work more remotely or, you know, say they're doing Instacart, they're driving around, but their hub is their home. Um, I think that changes and maybe we start to redesign the cities to fit that. Um, and then when you add on driverless vehicles and things like that and, and driverless transport, um, maybe that starts to, over the next 50 years. If, if, if Because the thing about remote working as well is that you have more of a chance to truly express the potential of your labor. Uh, because you might have more of a choice because when I have to physically go and drive to a place as opposed to I can virtually drive to any place in the world to express my labor. Now, the problem is the web is not really built to favor that yet. And that's what the emergence fights for. I want to have better technologies to help labor truly express itself with providers that really without the bounds of nature could really, we could explore truly our human potential. Mm -hmm. So what what do you think about, what are your thoughts on that? Oh yeah. Like it'll definitely revolutionize city design. And I think you brought up, it's interesting you brought up child rearing, like especially in the context of Marissa Mayer. Like one thing about interesting aspect of the work from home, like revolution the last years that people haven't noticed is that this isn't even how work from home like would usually be. Like for example, people, like I know there are reports like parents being stressed out, really stressed out by having their kids and work at their home at the same time, but it's only because schools are closed. And once like everything gets back down to normal, it'll be a lot easier to just raise your, it'll be a lot easier to raise your kids when you're working from home. Like you don't have to like rush from the other side of the metro to pick them up in case there's an emergency. Like you'll probably just be right down the street with more time on your hands. Like instead of having to do a long commute, maybe you have more time to read a book, you know, power yourself, educate yourself more time to cook. <laughs> like it's, uh, yeah, it's a lot more convenient. Like, you know, like your like domestic space is kind of tailored made for that. Like the only like problems like I've seen raised up in the context of working problems, like the kind of some of the, some burdens that the employer carries out are shifted onto the, to the worker. For example, like the, they try to have have like amenity, like some amenities, for example, like air conditioning, internet access, like, or access to a desk or even just literally ask to a computer. These are things that are, Yes. Yeah, like, or, like you have to, you have to provide these for yourself now. Like the business doesn't provide that for you anymore. But all the, but another dividend, like on the other side of the flip side of the coin, you also don't have to worry about workspace politics. You know, like well, yes, like, like you know, you don't have to kiss ass to advance. Like you just <laughs> yeah. you you show your labor by what you do on your computer. <laughs> you no, know, you don't. 
Like you don't have to risk anything when it comes to talking to people. Well, and you know, there's also, it's not to me, remote working is not necessarily only virtual either because, you know, uh, back in the day, mowing lawns, I mean, it's, it's, you're not, the, the idea of decentralizing the value of labor is taking components of what you have, your capabilities within you. You know, for instance, if somebody is a paraplegic and they, the only way they can express their labor is through their mind and their thoughts and, and their ideas, uh, you might find a paraplegic that one might end up being brilliant because of some of their shortcomings, just, just like a, a person who can't hear can um, see more clearly. People that can't see can hear more clearly. So mm-hmm. sometimes when you have limitations on, on, on your physicality, there's other things that can be expressed. But the problem is I don't think that really the free market, well, the, influ- let me, the influence market doesn't reward that. So beyond the virtual, you know, the virtual is like a discovery mechanism to be able to find the expression of labor. But I could I could then drive across town, but I'm not driving across town for the exclusive expression of my labor. I'm driving across town for that thing that I'm going to go help that lady with, you know, clean her house, do her books. Uh, maybe I've got, uh, maybe she just wants company. I know a couple of people that actually are uh, care for elderly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the elderly just wants company. They just want people to come by and talk to them and hang out with them and share stories with. And, you know, that's decentralized. You're not working for a, you know, you'll have a contractor that you work for. But I I think the thing about this influenced market, they like us in these silos and whoever they are. (laughs) I'm not, I don't think it's this vast cabal, but it's just human nature that wants to put us in these work silos. And that's where we've, we've evolved to. Um, But I I think the true revolution, evolution, the awakening is if we build these tools and break these centralized bounds of what these technologies are doing to us right now, which I truly feel it will, we will break these bounds in nature. You can't hold back what is being built. And there, as much as they are trying, we are going to break through it. And you're seeing elements of that with the sign, you know, welcome to the revolution, welcome to the revolution in their parlance, which I don't. I don't like those words, but that's their choice is that it's choice. Labor is my choice and I have more choices now. And I know you want me to work there as your, to some degree, widget, you know, businesses need widget. We need to have burgers, but you know, we got to think about this. Things are changing. So just because a company wants it and I demand my labor, I need my labor. Well, dude, (laughs) you know, I'm sorry, but uh, maybe the market, this influenced market is not, is not, it, the influenced market is not in sync with the choices that the labor and the value are starting to see. You can kind of see what I'm talking about. No, it's, I do. I do. Like, it's just, it's not very responsive. Like, that's the problem. And it's responsive for the reasons you pointed out. Like, like there's this vested interest in, in not doing it. There's vested interest in not paying workers their fair wage. There's vested interest in not giving you house protections housing like the work arrangements that you want accessibility for disabled people like no like like they want every reason like to save the buck or keep the workers under control and and that is true and here's the thing and this is what i like to do i like to i like to surf on both sides yeah. because then if we go too far with that then we are not going to have the hamburgers and not that we need hamburgers the salads the 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 cars the t-shirts course, like, the underwear the toilet paper <laughs> like know. there needs to be a synthesis between labor and capital like you know you, thank you which, that's like, brilliant which, like yeah like he says synthesis synthesis <laughs> yeah yeah like like for them because there does need to be the capital to do like to like for some innovations like for example like, like you just pointed out burgers like like there's a lot of capital that's needed for to achieve like meatless burgers beyond <laughs> no, like, labor, no. like labor can't do that on, on its own but like at the same time like labor like the cooperative workplace would be really great for most people have having a democratic choice and what they're able to do but at the same time you can't have too much democracy about everything it, it's exactly it and and you know i've got a um, i have a guy who owns a print shop that we use for a company and i built a relationship with him. And I didn't think this guy would even be open to work our co-op because he was talking about, he's got all this amazing print equipment for t-shirts and promotional items. Um, And I mean, millions of dollars of equipment. He's making enough money on his own, but he feels that he could really grow. But the thing is he can't 
find people to work for him and stay with him. And he had a previous business and he said it really wasn't that hard. And I said, and he was complaining about labor and he was complaining about these people won't show up. And I said, okay, you got to think about this. All right. That's a fact. They don't want to show up. So just go ahead and complain about it. And what are you going to do? You're, you, you've, and I did tell him is that you, we can't continue to see labor as a widget to where you're going to get somebody come in here and say that I'm going to do work for you. I'm going to set up that machine for you and you just do it and just work your ass off and do well and be fine with the wages I'm going to pay you. I said, things are dr- dramatically changing, drastically changing in that perception. So what I told him, what I started with, I wanted him to do this, this big training to where, you know, understand the value of what you are, because there's, there's people that will walk inside your print shop and see those colors of the paint and the smell of the paint and the smell of the, of the fabric and really dig it. But then if they're really digging it and you come and say, they're okay, set up the machine. Well, I don't understand how to set the machine. You'll figure it out. Just do it. Then it's a buzzkill. So you, you, it, labor has to be a combination of understanding the potential of what that labor is, the value of that, and then aligning it with what the provider needs. So, you know, find out what you offer. What are the, all the great things that you offer with your print shop and all this equipment? Train on that, put that on video, and then find people and connect them with that. Now, here's the thing. I don't think that's enough. Now, if you, and he started to talk about worker co-op, I said, Hey, I'm, you're preaching to the choir. I'm, I'm into that. So think about getting somebody involved in all aspects of that business. And you find those people that are interested in it at their core and then bring them on as partners, as opposed to as widgets. And then you might have something that could possibly change the dynamic of your company and what you can grow. I've been doing a lot of research on some of these companies that are worker co-ops and it's, it's pretty interesting of that idea of a democratized workplace where, you know, the hierarchy of the decision tree is not completely robbed of the person up top, but it's flattened out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Like, especially in the example of like, I like, I know I have her name too much, but Mondragon, you know, yeah, Mondragon and Mondragon in in Spain you're talking about. Yeah. Like, yeah, the Mondragon cooperatives, like in, like in the Basque country, like, like for like the example, like they, for the most part, they were able to weather the storm in the great recession. And I'm pretty based like because I, I did research for class or the previous semester. I think it was my fall semester. Yeah, like where what like Mondragon seems to be the weathering the storm of the pandemic pretty well too. Like like giving workers more choice, like more choice over, for example, what parts get shuttered, which no, it's pretty good. It's good, but at the same time, you you also don't completely rock, like to get rid of management. It's just like the positions are. Are, they're held to a better standard of accountability than they are today, where corporate CEOs pretty much own companies as their own private fiefdoms. Like the workers, like the stockholders don't No, the st- share. There's a st- stakeholder, stakeholders. Like the word yeah, yeah, no, I know. Shareholders yeah. versus stakeholders. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the stakeholders like don't really get much of a say. Like the manufacturers, the uh, people in charge of logistics, not rather instead of like the shareholders, the people who just have a stake in the company who can bail out anytime they want to. Well, and that's exactly it. And and I'm glad you said the word stakeholder and shareholder because I had an essay on that. And here's the dynamics. And I know you're, I know you're going to be able to really speak well to this. Uh, We've had a shift from the fifties and the sixties to where corporations were built more on the founders and the managers and their decisions. Now the decisions of the businesses have been moved over primarily to the corporation, to the shareholders. So the shareholders and, the, and you know, the, 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 the majority of businesses are small businesses, but the majority of the revenue generated from businesses is the big business. Mm-hmm. And the shareholders are the ones that have the, the reign over that revenue. And so management of companies have been moved over to shareholders who have no vested interest as a stakeholder in the business. And I think that's a fundamental problem, which which has really bridged us to more of an influenced market than a free market. Mm, yeah, the rise of neoliberalism since the 1970s, like that's like the big trend. We're like that's been like a source of a lot of society's problems. Shareholder theory from Milton Friedman. Yep. But, 
the company doesn't really have any so- social responsibility to either, so- or even re- op- social responsibility or obligation to society or its workers. It has responsibility to its stakeholders to make the most money, and that's it. <laughs> like, I think any- like anything else, be damned. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, I mean, that, that really, when you think about the value of labor, because if you don't have a manager and, and here's the thing. So what, what's happening is these shareholders are driving these big businesses that these small businesses are having to compete with that the, these big entities that are limiting competition in service of scale. So they're saying, we'll be able to give you cheaper prices just because we can scale. And so trust us to be able to own these markets and we'll do better. And that was, uh, I think Lena's, uh, uh, the FTC commissioner's argument with Amazon is that price is not always the best metric to look at in the, in the viability of a business and the value of a business, because even though you get cheaper prices, then to get cheaper prices, then you're going to provide more centralized control from fewer companies. Like, right. Yeah. Like you're fostering the creation of illegal monopolies, biopolies and illegal polys. Like, like there is, it's like a, it's a cost. Like a lot of consumers like really don't think about. Yeah. And, and speaking of, but Robert, you also have like the corporate raiders of today who buy up companies, asset strip them and then just dump it for dead. Like, like that's like one, not like another negative dividend of the rise of shareholder theory. And that's a major one. And uh, it, it, I guess it really, it, it, when looking through, uh, when looking at a common thread of what's hold, holding back the value of labor, it's uh, it's this influenced market that has been that has been just sat on and the weight of it. Because see, I love the idea of somebody expressing their labor in something valuable being built to help somebody else. You know, it could be toilet paper, it could be paper, it could be electronics, it could be a water, you know, it could be water bottle, it could be a, anything, a guitar, a piece of art. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we need that. We need people to to produce these goods, but this whole even the conservatives when I hear them argue about these things is that Really, when you think about the root of, of conservatism and, and, you know, the individuality is that, that we don't have that. The, the, the labor is not that, not what you're arguing for. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and produce a valuable good. Well, that's influenced and it's influenced really by the, uh, the, the political involvement of, of government and the shareholder theory to where we're making decisions based off of prices of shares, which are based off of speculation. They're not based off of performance. So the performance of a company's uh, of what they're doing and the value they're adding to the market is not in lockstep with the shareholder value of that corporation. I mean, some of these overvaluations are just insane. I mean, Tesla is way overvalued uh, for electric cars. I mean, it's way overvalued on their share price versus the actual, you know, they, they sell far fewer cars than even GM, not by even any stretch of the imagination. And they have more value from shareholder value. It's yeah, just, well, I was going to bring up Uber. Like, I, I think it's like a fact that not a lot of people know Uber is not operating at a profit. No, nope. like, no, like it's still losing like crap tons of like it's mostly floated by shareholder money like it's not like it seems like you strip that away it just collapses like same with tesla oh tesla like an interesting case where it gets a lot of subsidies yep they sure well. do yeah it's crazy but but here's the thing this is what i don't want to do and this is why i like to play both sides because mm-hmm. i i love the business owner taking a risk and and uh and and building a really cool product or something a functional product you know we all need toilet paper it's just a fact of life <laughs> uh you know we we all need paper towels we all need napkins we all need towels for our baths and, and nobody wants nobody wants to grab moss like our grandparents yeah yeah exactly <laughs> like, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah like no like uber like like everybody loves like being able to order a taxi from for the push of a button on your phone. Like, you know, nobody, I, I don't think I've ever met anybody who misses like the old taxi service, yep. you know, like, and like, it's just like, there's a whole racial politics. Like I'm, I'm not people whose parents have had horror stories of taxi drivers, like just skipping them because of their race, you know? Yep. Yep. Yeah, so 
the, what's interesting about Uber is like the big gamble is that they're waiting for self-driving cars to take off so they can cut out like the human, uh, like the human worker aspect of the company. <laughs> but so far it seems like the self-driving car like isn't anywhere close to coming out just yet. No, it will though. But, but Uber is one of those examples and I've been tracking this for a while. It's bro culture uh, of these. Oh, of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Travis, Cal- <laughs> like, Travis Kalanick is like a piece of shit. <laughs> like for, yeah. Although it seems one thing that's interesting about the whole self-driving car thing, it seems like it's further going further along, like in the trucking industry than it is like in like in the, oh, tax, in the taxi industry, which is pretty good. Inter- like it's really interesting when it comes to cutting costs. Which, but those like truckers, like they're going to need some help. Oh my so, God, yes, that's yeah, going to displace an, an entire industry. Yeah, and, and not just truckers, but you also have like the the gas stations, the restaurants, like the, the stopover points, like oh my anywhere God, between, absolutely. Like, so, like anywhere between San Francisco and, say, New York, is going to get fucked over really hard. Like, yeah, like, and it's going kind to of cause a lot more alienation and a lot more atomization. If you think people were in the Rust Belt are mad, like, of how many more people are going to be displaced. But at the and, same time, we, but we can't stop automation. Like, you don't want to kneecap yourself, like, considering no other nation will do that. China's not going to stop. No. It, like, no, Russia, like Russia, Russia, India, like, they're not going to kneecap themselves. No, no. And, and, and the thing is, OK, so the, the, the thought is, OK, these truckers that are going to displace, teach them coding. Right. That's a yeah. that's a, almost yeah, like that's, a meme. <laughs> it's, a, it's a meme, but it's not it's not a good meme. Like, no, it's a terrible it's like, one. Yeah, it's a, it's been a meme since like the 1990s. Like, with, from, like this is like one thing that get, look, there was like a really good book by a guy named Thomas Frank. Listen, liberal. Like that's kind of like a meme since the Clinton administration. Like, oh, workers can just be reeducated. If you just educate them more, the problem will be solved. But that's not really true. Like. Like meritocracy isn't the solution to everything, you know, like one way or like you're going to have to have a, well, a really robust welfare state. Like you just can't not have it. You need to have a good support structure. You need to have UBI and that UBI can be funded by taxing automation. You can have it by taxing carbon tax. I'm probably going to get in I know some people. No, no, no. Like, and then actually, this uh, wait, 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 I love uh, this. Because this is where we're going to differ a little bit. Okay, and I love it because like, I want okay, to differ. Okay, okay. Sin taxes like taxing cigarettes, taxing alcohol, <laughs> tax marijuana. Like it's a good like tax socially destructive behaviors. Tax well, drive, tax. And driving. I love that as long as I know the government's going to actually spin that on 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 you know the cigarette tax. Remember back in the day, like what fifteen years ago, where uh, I think even Arizona was guilty and Colorado was guilty. They 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 got this huge uh, settlement from uh, what Philip Morris, the, the, the cigarette companies, and those monies went into funds that were never proven to be distributed as they had mentioned they were. Now, I believe Colorado with marijuana taxes supposedly are doing pretty well with it, but I don't have enough data on that. So my, my thing is about the taxes, I, 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 I follow a little bit on the to the right on that, only for the fact of I have I have as much distrust of government, big government as I do as big business and, you know, even small government to some degree, because I've been in council meetings and how how just it's everything's so noisy, even without the technology. So and, and, and the thing that we we're you, you hit on the fact the welfare state. OK, so this is where we're going to differ a little bit, which I would I will be re- very respectful in this because. I do feel that people need help 100 percent and you know, homelessness. I mean, I'm I'm doing an episode series on, on homelessness. I'm in the in the throes of that. And I've it'll come out in a little bit. But I've, I've had some I've been thrown out of places here lately. Um, so there's going to be some interesting topics coming up on on the emergence. I can assure you yep. of, of some of the crap I've been dealing with, with trying to uh, look at homelessness. Uh, but are we. Where well, the welfare state is it? Is it just about giving people money, or is it about giving them opportunity that really meets their value of their potential expression of labor? UBI is a perfect example, and I went toe to toe with Vaughn on this because we were talking about when Andrew Yang was touting that. Is that I have no problem with giving people a thousand dollars a month, but I want to see personally some type of expression of labor from them. What have they done? Have they solved? Have they? Have they? you know, solve the puzzle? Have they, you know, have they done something to get that to where if they don't have any arms or they don't have any legs, what have they done with their mind? If they, if they have a, they have a problem with their mind, what have they done with their arms and their legs? I mean, just giving people something, just giving them money versus giving them opportunity is, is, I mean, welfare can be, I mean, Clinton was big on that, right? Oh on, yeah. On work, welfare. Work, work, welfare. Although 
that program. <laughs> I'm not exactly a big fan of welfare. Yeah. So where do you, what do you think about that? And what, where I'm, uh, I'm dissecting that on, on welfare, is it, do you feel like, for instance, UBI should, should they have, should the person receiving this money have to do something, maybe volunteer for a city or a state or, or uh, something in return? I personally don't think so. Like, like for example, like a disabled person, like a lot of people aren't able to do like programs that, pro- that are usually using World Warcraft. For example, picking up trash, volunteering. Like a disabled person might not be able to do that, you know, for obvious reasons. I mean, what a, or a person like both mentally and physically disabled. Like there's like so many like outlier cases like where doing like a work fair thing is really tricky. And like work fair, like in the whole, like the whole Clintonia thing of kicking people off of work, if, I mean, clicking people off of welfare if they don't. Yeah, work certain time. Like there's like in certain times, like a great economic downturn. But, like that finding work isn't easy. <laughs> like or even like I'm not. I'm also like not really too much of a big fan of means testing. You know, like you're just making it harder like for people to get the benefits that they deserve. Like it, like there's it's not even just the problem of, like the of work fair. Like there's also the time the whole issue of the time tax. Like it's a. Are you familiar with Ann Lowry? Um. Oh yeah, yeah. I am actually. Did yeah. you turn me on to her. Uh, I yeah. I just kind of said, I think I just gave you one of her articles before, but she came out with a really good article about the this issue called the time tax. I'm going to post it on the now say that again. What was the word? Uh, time tax. It's yeah. essentially like the the tax on people. It's it's kind of like such a the burden on people's times that you place like when people have to fill out documentation or just get through the process of bureaucracy. For example, there's a quote from Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida. I really don't like yeah. that. I said that in the context of a COVID relief, like COVID relief and stimulus programs, like he's made it to like the process, like the paperwork are so hard that the least amount of people get the money. Like that's the whole point of why like the, there is a burden, you know? And yeah, like this is like the case for a lot of welfare programs. Like, like this is like something I've kind of get annoyed about, like, like fellow like liberal or left minded people. Like it's the one thing for a welfare program to exist. It's another to make it more accessible like another issue to make it more accessible to people, you know, like work fair means testing, jumping through so many hoops, like some of these like documents that you have to get through are like 40 pages. And like some of these questions, like take as much as like almost an hour to complete, you know, a lot of people working class people who don't have the time for that. Like, like well, yeah. it harder and harder for people to get their benefits or even basic aid. Like it's just, well, and I, and I see where you're coming from, but here's the thing, and this is where I think we're, we're trapped in this, this bureaucratic institutional, what people would call nanny state. Uh, I don't call it that. I don't like the labeling of that. But, but okay, your argument in this influenced market is, is true to some degree, I believe. So, but my whole argument is to build technology around the influenced market because that person who can't do a, uh, uh, some chores where they are disabled physically, then I believe we should build a better connection where there's some value that they can express as a volunteer or for something for someone else online. If they can't do it physically, I, I, I refuse to believe that we can't build technologies to be able to do that and to where people are able to get assistance. And now there are going to be some people that can't do it. Any of it. I agree with that. Then they, that's welfare. Bloom. Um, done. But I, I, I'm telling you that there are a lot of people that can and that, but they don't have the ability to do that. Like you're saying, these bureaucratic forms that they have to fill out. That's absolute bullshit. That's absolutely bullshit. And mental health. Let's talk about mental health that actually decreases the value of labor. I can guarantee you that um, oh, no, across definitely. the board. And, and, you know, just trying to find help for somebody for anxiety in this influenced market is freaking insane of no, how like difficult it is like they'll try this is like it's not just the problem with the government like which you know the welfare state's been gutted within the last like 30 years it's also a problem with the private sector like people like there's stigma still there people companies barely want to give money to workers to or even like benefit like health benefits like when it comes to therapy to like like another like mental health services you no know, and like well, it's it's a all i think there is from like what i've seen like there might be a turnaround coming to work because we America might be having its mental health and with the whole thing with Simone Biles, it, 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 people are becoming more aware of it. But yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, that's, I think that's at the core of our homeless problem. Um, and yeah, like there's also drug use, like 
drug use needs to be treated like doesn't really get treated. It's treated more like a criminal issue than a health issue still. Well, it's a mental health issue because if you're abusing drugs, I mean, if you're if you're casually yeah. using drugs and you're functional is different than if you're abusing drugs to cope and you're out on the street. It's it's a men, it's mental health. It's not necessarily mental illness. It's it's mental health. And I I've argued on this show before is that that's the moonshot to me that that is at the core of everything. We build technology to be able to make mental health more accessible to every person on the planet that will then become those people will be more proactive. And, and now their bootstraps become stronger because they are have the, the mental acuity to be able to handle some of these issues and to be more of a of a, a, a participant. And, you know, until they are, they need help. They meant they need, you know, that, to some degree, that thousand dollars to should go to that. If somebody's struggling, you know, uh, we need more programs for uh, specific education to be able to help people realize it's about realizing potential. And, and if you, if you, if you have a, if your daddy put out cigarettes on your back <laughs> growing up, you know, some people have the strength to overcome that, but it's almost like this influence market. Well, it, it's built on the strength as opposed to built on bringing people stronger from weakness. It's just, it, it, it's built on preying off of the strength of people as opposed to making weak people stronger. You know, people that have weaknesses that, you know, because there are some people that have had cigarettes put out of them as kids and abused that are strong and they end up being very productive citizens. But there's a lot of people that haven't. And, and you know, you could have a twins in a family that were abused the same way. And one twin is copes with life extremely well. And the other is a heroin addict. So, okay, what are you going to do? Just kick that heroin addict to the curb and, and chase them away and, and or, or, or are you going to try to understand why that twin had what do they do to make them turn out that way and whatever that is what programs are available what resources are available to help them express their value of labor because everything to me is about the expression of labor because if you can have enough substance and, and, and value in life. Because here's the thing, value is not only monetary. Value is validation. If I go and mow an old man's lawn or an old woman's lawn, I get validation. That's expression of my labor. Mm-hmm. But we're not really built on that. We're not built. It's all about monetary. It's, it's, I, I think that we can start to move a little bit beyond. Yeah, beyond putting a price tag on everything. It, there's a really fun quote. There's people who know the price of everything, but the value by putting a price on everything, you know, the value, but you don't actually, you know, the value of nothing. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, you know, like move towards, like move towards thinking about labor is not just like it's a monetary thing, but as a same time that brings you happiness, something that you're not alienated from something who's maybe some, maybe you want to do labor to work on something that stands the test of time. You want to provide for your community for some work for somebody you love. <laughs> Yeah. And I I think possibly something's going on here too in the market to where some people aren't going back to work because some people are fine with living with less. (laughs) Uh, There there are like some people who really do embrace like the degrowth mindset or just like, just live simply. Like, you know, if somebody just wants to live like a middle class, like they don't want to be like a jet, they don't want to be a jet setter. Like, that's fine. Like there's like, you know, like there's not really that drive or, you know, that there's not, there's not that greed and good mentality that animated like baby boomers. Like, for example, yeah, you know, yeah. like the whole Gordon Gecko yuppie type. Like, no, like if anything, like there are those types are kind of frowned upon <laughs> those people I know. Well, and that's what I'm getting from Gen Z a little bit is that because you guys do have that tool set, I though, and, that, and that's why I'm really curious to see what you do with it coming up because uh, the next 20, 30, 40 years, because the next 20, 30, 40 years, we are going to see the driverless cars. We are going to see the augmented reality glasses. We are going to see uh, a, a complete change in how we are connected. And what are we going to do with it? Is it going to be black mirror dystopian or is it going to be more towards we really are tapping into our potential and we're decentralized? We're, you know, are, are we controlled? Are we controlling? You know, are we ourselves? Because my argument for the emergence is that build tools to help people help themselves and help others and inspire that, you know, inspire because I like the individuality. I love that. I love the fact of that's why I'm, I like the anarcho syndicalist idea. Uh, you know, it, it's about. It's about self, but it's also about community. But my thing is that whenever you go too far on community, (laughs) you get then there's a vacuum that the 
powerful can take advantage of. When you go too far to the individual, <laughs> you have a vacuum of power that an ind- other people can take advantage of. Pretty and, much, like especially with there's even the problem like of atomization, for example. Yeah, you're like you're from, you're familiar with like Robert Putnam, right? Yes. Yeah, like you know the destruction of the communi- communal institutions. Like, lots of people going to church. Lots of people going to like attend, like being a part of their local Rotary Club. Like, or, or even just like doing any social activity. Like, you know, we have like declining rates of friend, like male friendships, like since the nineties, we are declining rates of like female friendships, you know, like that's like one drawback for like, ge- like, like that. I probably you know, like a lot of members of Gen Z experience, like sure. Like the social, like social media has connected us, but at the same time, it gets also divided us in the sense that like, we don't really meet in per- like some friend groups don't really meet in person as much as they used to, <laughs> like in say in the nineties or eighties. And well, like, I think a more communal vision could help like if, restoring like some of these institutions, like not all of them, for example, I'm not a big fan of restoring churches. Um, yeah. Well, and yeah. Uh, but now do you, you don't like the idea of banning churches though, obviously. Oh no. You? Oh no. Obviously I'm yeah. not like a Trotsky type. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but like, like, but like, yeah, like some of these institutions were pretty bad for press groups. Like for example, LGBT, LGBTQ people for women, like, like, okay. We're within like, like you're both you're within living memory of like no like the non-existence of no fault of divorces the time when women had to beg their husbands to open up their bank accounts or oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah, yeah, we're we're yeah. not that far removed from that time like, like no we're not yeah like the time of the like that like the set people have underestimated like how revolutionary the period from 1960 to about 1980 was <laughs> Like, well, well, I was born during the civil rights. So, you know, yeah. 1963, I mean, that's, uh, you know, to some degree, how far we have come, I mean, is, is to some degree fairly amazing. Yeah, it's but, interesting, like Martin Luther King himself, like talk about the issue of automation too, like, I remember. Correctly. Yes. Yeah. Like it's inc- like incredible, like, like how much has changed. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that, okay. So for instance, when you talk about churches, is that I'm, I'm not religious. I was, I was raised Catholic. I still like to go to Catholic church because I love the architecture, but then you also think about how much money they're spending on that. Oh yeah. Uh, there's also the issue of like, the, <laughs> like I like have some buddies, like college buddies who are like liberal Catholics, but like we're, that are not like, like a dead like me are not fans of the clergy, like in the issues that are. Oh yeah. Se- yeah like, they, they, like certain issues about sexual peculiarities that are probably not worth going too much into. Well, and the thing is that I personally, I, I'm, I'm a spiritual person and I, I love the the idea of God and energy and all that. And and uh, I just like anything else. So I see that there's abuse and the trappings of uh, when you see these mega churches. I, uh, oh, God, and- I, I've been to like one. Of, I've been to uh, I attended because of a friend. Like, well, just like a social occasion, Christ Church of the Valley. They beg you for donations and they have like a giant rock band playing like like you are definitely like that chart is definitely not in need of money. <laughs> like, well, yeah. there's an Instagrammer that calls out, he'll take pictures of a uh, televangelist and he'll uh, make reference to their belt buckles on their shoes. And they'll put, he'll put the actual price of those goods and they're, you know, $6,000 shoes and $5,000 alligator belts and, and rings. And they, he makes their memes and they just call out and it's actually, you can link on the source and you can see what they're wearing of what these televangelists are wearing. And uh, you know, wh- where are they getting that money <laughs> and uh who knows maybe the big man is just like throwing dollars down at him <laughs> yeah and, and, and yeah. or you have the peter popoff types too like you know you know who he is right uh who peter popoff like that one televangelist who got exposed for oh like, wearing, it, wearing an earpiece like the other messages from god oh oh geez that's funny <laughs> Yeah, there's like a funny being popular. Well, my own namesake, Jesse Duplantis, is the one that, you know, bought a jetliner to be able to, and he justified the jetliner, um, his own individual 747, I believe, so that he could go spread his word as opposed to just flying coach, Jesse Duplantis. And, and I just, I'm ashamed that he shares my name, to be honest with you. Yeah, shame um, to all Greek Americans everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, so, they're it's actually cajun it's uh i'm french canadian oh, <laughs> just to shit. let you know you know people say, people confuse oh, that a lot it's funny yeah, Vaughn, no Vaughn always told me they're like you think your last name that you guys last name's greek or something oh did he i gotta talk to him about that no yeah, I'm I, cajun. I, I, I'm I, french canadian oh shit <laughs> yeah I was, I was, it always sounded weird he's like oh i, oh, I gotta talk to him that nut yeah that's funny like, no because no because he talks about calling like i think it was like great grandmother like yaya or something like that or is it like 
Well, no, that's no, that's on Sharon's side. That's a yeah, yeah. But uh, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Like, yeah, yeah, yep, yep. That was like weird. I was like, Dupont is, it sounds like a, it sounds Greek, but it also the do part like messes the other. Like, it's oh, a lot of people think my name is Greek, so that's not. It's a common misperception. So, but uh, um, so yeah, there's this whole thing about, but but you know, here's the thing: when we talk about the expression of of labor and beyond just money, is that. Uh, Okay, so part of my experience in homeless, my my homeless deal that I'm writing an essay on is that um, I've been trying to, as opposed to talk about it, understand it. So I befriended a homeless lady, a Native American 57-year-old lady and and looking for resources. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on it, but I was tracking before I met her. I was I found a city of Mesa has an organization that is working on homelessness because in, in the state of Arizona, uh, homelessness, I believe, has uh, doubled. No, the city of Mesa, it's doubled in the last four years, homelessness. And in Maricopa County, it's tripled in the last three or four years. So there, and I, where I work, it's an endemic. It's a terrible problem. And it breaks my heart. So on one of these podcasts that the council, the, 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 um, um, well, the head of the city council was talking and he brought on this pastor. He brought on this pastor from a local community church. And he was specifically asked the question, what do you think is the best way? What, what is the best thing that a person can do to help a homeless person? And he literally said, I don't think you should give them water. I don't think you should give them money. I think you should go to your food bank, your local institution and give money to them. And that, that really struck me. And that absolutely excuse the French fucking piss me off because oh, yeah, like it's like for the institution's benefit, like not for the actually can, it's like you're, they're actually making you go through the middleman. So like going directly to the person themselves, you know, and it's, it's institutionalized. And, and, and I was on a, uh, I went to a, um, a sober house to help my, Native American friend, and they basically kicked me out and uh, came to my workplace and threatened me. Um, this will oh, be really? revealed later. Yeah. Oh, I've got all kinds of details. I, I was freaking Vaughn out on some of these stories. Like, my God, I had no idea you were doing this. Yeah. So, but, but here's the thing that really struck me. It's this institution. And you think about the institutions of churches, you think about the institutions of work, you think about the institutions of sports and, and, you know, uh, the, the labor, the labor of attending church and wanting to honor God. God, your, your God, whatever your God is, Buddha, you know, uh, Allah, uh, Jesus, whatever it is, you know, the, the, it, it's this, <clears throat> your expression of, of, cause it is labor. I mean, your labor of, of going and praying, of going and meditating. And, and it's this idea of this institutionalized control over what you are feeling, how, how I feel about God, how I feel about a homeless person, how I feel about my work. You know what I mean? It's, it's this thing that, that our labor is being, it's our labor isn't as the institutions, they pat us on the head, business and government and these programs, they pat us on the head. We got you. We, we got your back. You know, we'll, we'll, you know, you, you come to our church, you come, you know, don't, don't, don't give a person water. I mean, literally the problem I'm having is trying to find a way to give this home pers- a, a homeless person resources versus just giving her money. I gave her 20 bucks, but I didn't want to just give her money. I wanted to give her opportunities yeah, like- and holy shit has that been hard. So, you know, this value of labor is this influence marking market to me, in my opinion, in the opinion of the emergence, the emergence is that it's suppressed. And I think you're correct on that. Like, especially like the example of the, like the homeless. Shit. Yeah. Like there are a lot of middle, like middlemen, like that, like, well, it's not even the words, like middlemen's not even the right words. Like re- it's rent seekers, you know, like people. Rent just seekers. Wanna... Is that what you just said? What did you just say? Oh, rent seekers, rent yeah. seekers. Like there's yeah, a lot of, thank you. that's a good. Yeah, like a, this is like a, this is a, like I've never been on Twitch. You know, no, you know, nailed the head on this one. Yeah, that's, like, that sober house. I, I was going to take money from them by giving her another opportunity. I guarantee it. Oh yeah, like you're like essentially like taking away like what? Yeah, like another opportunity. They're getting them. reimbursements from the government or from somebody. Yeah, yeah. So I'm taking away from them. They, the guy actually told me what we we question why you want to help her. We're helping her. <laughs> so rent yeah, like I love that. That's great. Yeah, like it's a problem with like I said housing. It's a problem with tech. It's a problem with the pretty much everything yeah uh, like it's like a some like it is like one of the big problems of the century although way behind climate change <laughs> although the big he- or the big headers 
Yeah. And even on climate change, here's the thing. And I know that you and I are going to um, vary on this a little bit. I, I love I'm, I'm more of a and I'm not a technocrat. You know, people could accuse me of being a technocrat, but I'm I'm not politically motivated on technology. I'm people motivated. So I, my, my thing is I, I I'm not big on the as much of the scare tactics of, of climate change. I'm big on getting in, rolling up the sleeves and and using these technologies to help a client because I love a clean environment. I want a clean environment. That to me is the incentive. I want to breathe clean air. I don't want businesses to pollute. Uh, so we need to create better technologies um, and, and better communities to build. And just like you said about the fact that people not in my backyard, well, you know, these people that are these big environmentalists don't want windmills and the, and their view of their ocean. You know, you know I was watching, a, I was actually watching a clip the other day of the, the girl, do you remember the one that Martha's, it was supposed to be built in Martha's Vineyard, right? Yes. Like all yes. those years ago? Yes. <laughs> like, yeah, Yada, what's his face? Walter Cronkite <laughs> coming up after it. <laughs> like, doing you know, ads against, yeah, like, like, maybe it's like a, bi- it's a bipartisan, right? Well, yeah, it's a bipartisan thing. Oh, like, it is. Like, Absolutely. Every, like, everybody's an envy. Like, 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 I've met, like, for example, I know some people, buddies of mine from Tempe who don't like the idea of, like, like more, ha- more apartments being built. But the thing is, like, if, I, if you alleviate the housing crisis, you also alleviate homelessness. <laughs> but no, like, it, it's like it's a, it's an aesthetic thing, like for at least for like that aspect. But there's also the right wing part of like, oh, don't not want to depreciate your housing values or not supporting clean clean energy because it cuts into say your investments in carbon, like in like carbon intensive like energy sources. Absolutely. And that to me is a big one. That was, but you know, when you look at what they're doing in in um, um, Texas with wind. Uh, but you know, when I hear conservatives talk about the windmills are, are, are chopping up birds, it's like, Oh, okay. Cause since when have they ever give a, given a fuck about the environment? Let's be real. <laughs> like, well, yeah. I don't want, I don't like to overly generalize, but I know. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, okay, I, okay, yeah. But my yeah. thing is build They're They're building better turbines that aren't destroying birds. And that's my thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Right? There's like, there's design innovations. Like it's not just like the same technology all the time. Um, yeah. like, there's also one thing that like also like yeah like let's not shit on them too much like there's also like some like there's left wing groups that will block construction of a new solar power state of the art solar power plant in Nevada I'm trying to look it up right now. Oh yeah yeah oh they're coming up with so many and and here's the thing money people are starting to discover that they can make money off of this stuff and you know and and I I I think we should continue to innovate and. Uh, uh, you see, I'm big into hydrogen. I'm big into fuel cells as opposed to battery technology. I, I personally believe that's the future. I know they're doing it. When you talk about trains and buses and things like that, they're big on that in Europe. And they seem to be way advanced on on, on, on a lot of these fronts in, in Europe and what they're doing with, with energy. Uh, so hydrogen in of itself. I mean, there's so many things that we could do uh, because really, even if you're conservative, don't you in the end want a clean, don't you want a clean stream? You know, not in my backyard, <laughs> but if you're going to have to travel, you know, even, and even though I'm the homeless thing, you know, just kicking somebody out of your neighborhood isn't going to solve the problem of homelessness. And at some point that is going to affect your business. At some point, homelessness is going to affect your business. So you should have a vested interest in solving the core of the homeless problem, not just the, the, you know, the facade of it, you know, just the blight. And he's like, Oh my God, there's dirty people on the streets begging. It's like, no, let's, you know, we, let's fix the mental issue to where, why there's people blighted on the street. Yeah, <laughs> you the know? mental, the housing issues, but no, yep. like, for a lot of people, it's just out of sight, out of mind, you know, just push them out to the periphery. It's like, it's, it's the reason people don't want a homeless shelter built next to them. They don't want to see like the, like the actual, like costs, like the mental health crisis. Well, and be honest with you, I don't know if I want a homeless shelter right next door to me. I mean, think about that. If you were living in a house right. that you spent well, four hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollars on, would you want a homeless shelter right next door? Well, obviously not. You wouldn't build it in the suburbs or like somewhere more towards the city center, like, you know, where all the high rises are so they can have access to more resources. And oh, yeah. Like, yeah. And it's a hard problem. Like I mean, if, you put, hard... if you like put about the edge of town, like, say, I don't know, Apache Junction, Buckeye. I, I don't know if, like how I'm pretty sure like, the geog, like some people in the audience will get the geog, but essentially like, on the east, the very eastern edge of town, the very western edge. Like, no, like, like you, have, you have to put them somewhere. It's the same with a. Uh, What's so there's like one institution that a lot of people don't like being built next to them. I'm trying to think. Yeah, drug treatment centers. Like like yeah, people need access to resources. Oh my god, yeah, that's a sober house, right? right. That was the yeah. instance I had. Don't even I I am telling you, I will dig in with the uh, in the future because this sober house was 
almost scary, yeah. but have not. Ever, oh not, yeah, have you ever, sorry, go on. Well, not not in not in the environment itself is where I what I felt they were doing to the people <laughs> because I, I kind of went into the belly of the beast on that. So when you're talking about drug rehab, you're talking about sober houses. I, I do believe that there's there, there's things that are deep within these institutions on some of these things that are OK. Here's here's the argument. Is it because if we're doing climate change, if we're doing all of these things, is it for the betterment of the end stakeholder? That's all that matters. So these drug rehab, these sober houses, these homeless shelters is is the core of it for the health and the betterment of the people involved. Uh, even climate change is is your actions and your political involvement. Is it for the betterment of the end or is it for the the excitement and raising money. You know what I mean? Is, is, yeah, that's, it, is it for the rent seeking? Yeah, yeah. See, the rent seeking. That's beautiful. I uh, absolutely like that. I've heard that word, but I've never really exercised the, the context yeah. of it. That's beautiful. It's, it's, a, it's a good phrase. Like once like I've learned, I can't. Un- stop using yeah. You can't it. unthink it. <laughs> yeah. That like, is so uh, true. So like in the context of climate change, I, I don't think it's really rent seeking like to focus on that issue at all. Like if anything, it's like one of the, it's not like the greatest cri- like crisis facing like, not just like American society, but international, like the international community as a whole. Like, like no, like I don't, It's kind of like a like a really conservative argument to say like, oh, climate scientists are only saying this because they want funding. Well, no, clean energy companies only want subsidies. Like, no, like they compare like whatever like subsidies like clean energy companies get is a pittance compared to how many subsidies the fossil fuel companies get. We throw a lot of money at fracking, say like in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, like or we throw a lot of money at petroleum in Texas. Or to in even Alaska, like yeah, we essentially you remember the pipeline protests back yep. in uh, 2016, Standing Rock. We we sent out the National Guard to pretty much attack. Like, the, yeah, uh, yeah, I remember. Like, that. Yeah, like no, like, we have a we're like the government essentially for both it, like for like yeah, bipartisan like just like pulls circles wagons around fossil fuels. Even Barack Obama, like you know, like for a really liberal president, like he bragged about turning the United States into the number one producer of petroleum in the world. <laughs> oh yeah. And that's, and that it's, to some degree, administrations can change, but yeah, like the politics the, don't. But the imperative, like a, for example, like trying to win votes in Pennsylvania, like Joe Biden, you cannot, remember like Joe Biden's like take on fracking and a Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders, anti-fracking mostly because of like climate change, Joe Biden, like not anti-fracking mostly because like he needs, so he needed to win Pennsylvania in the election. Like it's like a matter of convenience. So yeah. in the case of climate change, I think there's more like there's a lot of incentive not to act on it and then to act at least like for like elite like in the actors that have cap that have like taken a lot of markets captive. Well, and we, my my, my argument is to act on it. It's just how you act on it, and and just just the just the 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 the, the fear of our we're going to be underwater in in ten years is because here's okay here's my here's my and this is actually kind of the value of labor. I want I want to come back to this. You know, if you were, if you had the messaging to bring the conservatives into the solution, because I'm telling you what, you can talk all you want. And this whole thing about taking away gas and the earth is going to implode in the next 15 years, you've got 50% of the solution that is just going to fight you on it because that's just for good or worse. That's just the way that it is. You're not inviting them in to the solution as much as the fact of, okay, you know what? Roll up our sleeves and figure out a way to create clean technology that businesses can make money on. And it just doesn't, I know it seems like a super simple uh, thought process on this, but it's, it just seems, it just seems so politicized on this. And I do agree that we need to have a clean environment. I'm not going to say that the earth is going to implode in 15 years. I don't, I don't, I don't think that I do believe that industrialization has impacted it greatly, but my thing is roll up the sleeves and let's build a better use cases and, and really focus on these solutions. And, and, you know, if our windmills are chopping up birds, then let's let's do the next one geothermal i mean there's so kinetic energy there's so yes. many things nuclear power like nuclear power absolutely what are your thoughts on nuclear power because i'm I'm, pr- I'm very pro nuclear power like i've i can also people who are anti-nuclear power but they put they put like the edge like the very like martin looking like chernobyl and uh fukushima but like it, it doesn't kill as much as like say coal coal or natural gas do every year through carbon emissions like people underrate like how deadly like fossil fuels are like it's not it's not just the coal miners to get trapped in mining disasters in west virginia it's like the car the air you breathe whether it's in on the streets of say new delhi or it's the streets of beijing (laughs) 
like yeah, you're gonna want to replace those power. Like what Freddie said, sturdy sources with something cleaner. Oh sure, yeah, nuclear, absolutely. Nuclear is like not ideal because like a lot of people do prefer, say like when or like hydroelectric. But I think nuclear power is really great. Like there was that, although like the entire nuclear movement really annoys. There was that one plant in New York that was closed down. I think it was like Indian Point is what it's called, and that power that the vacuum of that power source got replaced by fossil fuel sources. <laughs> so yeah, well, remember although, that. Remember that conversation we had about uh, uh, the big thing is about reclaimed nuclear fuel rods. Uh, we talked about that, I think, a couple of years ago. And I don't re- you might remember the examples, but that's a thing that with, through government regulation has been held back is about the oh, fact yeah. of re- being able to reclaim spent nuclear rods. Like there's an enormous amount of potential nuclear energy in that in of itself. Uh- let me search that up really quick. Yeah. Can you, what, what was that? What was that? I know that because we, I remember specifically I'd shared the article with you, but you've got a nice nubile young mind. I've got an old boomer uh, is, mind. Is it this Forbes one? Why we don't recycle nuclear fuel rods? I think you could be this one. Uh, let me see this really quick. Yeah. Like there's a perception that it's not cost effective and, it, and it'll lead to more nuclear weapons or like you're old enough to remember Three Mile Island, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, like, yeah, that whole China syndrome thing, people are really scared about it. But in reality, nuclear power is, like, safer for people than coal. You know, coal, you, it's not, you also, like, stripped to mine entire mountains. Like, oh, my you, God, you, yes. Yeah, like, I, I've never been to West Virginia, but I've seen the photo. But I've seen the photo, like, like the entire, like, landscapes that have been just torn apart. You know, it's like some giant hand to grab the mountain. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's not the best long-term solution. There's absolutely not. Who wants oh, to cool. see that? I mean, who wants to... And, but there's other. But here's the thing: when there's other ways to be able to claim these, the, the energy, um, just why, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we? I mean, there, there's 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 money made in that. I mean, you have labor. Labor is is actually uh, nuclear energy. There's labor to put plants together. There's labor to maintain it. There's labor to architect it, engineer it. Yeah. Um, For uh, the reason, like people have made the show choice of like harvesting coal instead of solar power or wind like because it it is cheaper but recently the pipe for example the price of a uh, solar po- like the what like the hours I think it was like absolutely watch, it's I gone think down. It was like watch yep. per hour like it's yep. gone down like it's which is incredible i'm trying to look for the art there's a like one really good article from david wall here it is from david wallace well like yeah like it's this past year has been a downer from the pandemic but re- with regards to content it's been pretty good for reducing the energy like cost, which is a great thing. So it'll incentivize more people to adopt the yep. energy. Yeah. The war on climate denial has been won. It's not the only good news. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I like the idea of uh, nuclear. I like the idea of hydrogen. Um, and I, I guess it's a part of this, this innovative spirit that I think we're about to really witness and not only the expression of labor, I guess, and the expression of these tool sets, not just communication technology like nuclear. And I, I, I'm big on wireless power. I've been big on wireless power for 20 years. And and I know there's a lot of caveats with it and a lot of problems with it. I think when we look back in 50 years, I think that wireless power, they're going to figure out a way because, you know, Nikola, Nikola Tesla was onto this 100 years ago. And they are going to find a way to safely generate wireless power. Whenever we have wireless power and we have geothermal and we have nuclear and we have, uh, uh, you know, kinetic and we have all these different power sources and then you're able to hop the electricity uh, wirelessly to our watches, our cars, our microwaves. I think that truly is going to change the fabric of how society works. And we should work towards building towards that. And that's, and, and the thing is by like, I like about wireless is that natively that could be a much more decentralized approach because I could generate geothermal and you're not just sending it to the grid. Here's the thing. The grid is centralized of electric. And let's talk about how, how antiquated the, in the United States of America, the electrical grid is. Oh, and yeah, <laughs> let's talk uh, about Enron and let's talk about, you know, futures and, and selling uh, uh, electrical. The whole um, issue with like Texas over this like past winter was like Texas because of its, independent culture is like has its own complete power grid separate from the rest of the country and because of that we couldn't really transfer them any power <laughs> like they're in the, the big blizzard that rolled through like yeah like our like our infrastructure the way it's not like not just the way it's structured but also the way 
like this might bill is really bad. Like, which is one reason I think like the infrastructure bill that's currently stuck through Congress is really critical. You know, we have to like tear everything out and replace it with something a lot better. And it's yes. not just power. We're, we're talking about like bridges and we're talking about like basic, like even just basic roads and highways. We need to refurbish like trains. Oh, Amtrak. Because, I know that. Yeah, did, that we, did that make it through? How much, what, what part of Amtrak made it through this uh, latest version? Uh, I have not been keeping too much track of it. My, let me check my uh, Twitter group. You know, you know, uh, Vaughn took the uh, Amtrak all the way to Chicago. Oh and, yeah, he told me like yeah, all yeah. The way to, yeah, which is really great. I, I know I just know the bill's been being gutted recently. I know it's going. They're doing like a paygo thing where it's being paid by pandemic relief funds that were not used. Oh okay, okay. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, let me look it up. But we'll keep talking while I do this. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, you know, the idea of trains and public transportation is is you know even. It, <laughs> That's another thing about the expression of labor is is because we are still here, here's the thing still, people are still going to have to physically go to places to work. Uh, some people can have more choice and more, but at some point we're not going to completely be staffed by robots. So, building bridges, building roads, uh, working in a warehouse, even though that's going to become more and more automated, uh, people will still need to get to their place of of work. And you should. I mean, some people just want to go and have the community of working at work. I mean, there's no. Uh, I'm not saying that. That's the, the, that we should shift away from it. I just say that people should have more choice in where they're expressing their labor. So maybe they go to two or three different jobs throughout the week. Um, and uh, and while they're there at the work, that they have more of a partnership and they have more of a, a piece in, in building that solution. They're more involved in it. And uh, how that goes back to transportation is I think that the infrastructure of driverless pods, not necessarily driverless cars, but, you know, driverless driverless trains and, and things like that, I think can really help uh, kind of recalibrate that people giving people more choice, more effectively and inexpensively. There's things about when you talk about robo taxis in the future that at some point it's going to be incredibly economical to ride in a driverless pod uh, that per mile, it's going to just make more sense than owning a car. So I think some of these things with infrastructure that what we do now can really serve that value of labor in the future. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Like just being able to, like, especially for people who can't afford cars, like, like you can be able to take a, like, especially the light rail. Light, like, I know I have a buddy of mine who loves taking the light rail to. Before the pandemic, he loved taking the light rail from his work from his home in Tempe to downtown Phoenix. Like, you know, you don't have to worry about gasoline costs. You don't have to worry about, like, say, getting broken down. Like, it's it's a hell of a lot better. And like in Vaughn's case, it's easier to take. It's great to take a vacation if you're able to go. If it's like cheap to go to say Phoenix to Chicago, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. it's brilliant. The, that was now, a great how, now, now imagine how better it would be if like it was like a high speed rail. Like, look at how yep. China, Europe about pace and like with regards to yep. that. Like it's kind of a, I think it's like a kind of a sign of economic, like a technological stagnation a bit, like compared to like where we were in the seventies. Like I know, like there's one example I read in a book recently. Like say travel time, it was like I think it was like travel times by air from New York to London. And now it takes a longer, an hour longer than it did in the seventies, which is crazy to think about. Yeah, but yeah, like no, high speed rail like is a must. Like, same with yeah. the, the, the light rail. I know people hate, like this is like another thing where NIMBYs come. On. People hate the light rail. Like, I love the light rail. <laughs> I love everything yeah, about it. Yeah, no, but if you're someone from Scottsdale, like you, oh, you want to keep the quote unquote riffraff. <laughs> you're gonna want to block like the extension of it all the way to there. And ditto if you're from Mesa. Yeah, but, and I've had, I've seen that, and I've taken light rail, and it's the people that are going to work, people going to sports venues, people that are going to bars that are don't want to drink and drive. I mean, yeah, like more uh, accessibility, like yeah, you know, and I, it's I, I I'm just I'm just perplexed by the fact of the fight on that because all right, you're gonna you you, you don't want the streets to be torn up, but you have cars that are congesting the streets, so uh, you know. I, I, I and then that's why I like the idea of, of of driverless pods as well. About the fact of uh, because maybe you don't have to invest as much on tracks, but maybe the 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 train tracks and the rails are going to be more for bigger destinations. But the fact of public transportation where you don't have to own your own car needs to be our future. Yeah, car free cities. There's a I know. Let me look for it really quick. Like, I know there's a movement to, you know, are you familiar with the, I think I told you about the concept of 15 minute cities, right? Oh, the 15 minutes, what? 15 minute cities. 
Oh, I don't know if I talked to you about that, but I, I know. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, like yeah, cities, like cities, that. like where every amenity that you need is like within 15 minutes walking distance of like your housing. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if you want to go to the supermarket, like that's within walking or biking distance. You, know, you don't have to own a car to get there. Like, say, if you want to go, say, to the library, if you want to go see a movie, if you want to eat down, sit down in a nice restaurant with a friend or with a date, and like, yeah, like for example, there's a big movement for that in Paris. There's a movement for that in Tel Aviv. Even it's even as like some pl- places that you wouldn't expect, for example, in Bogota and Bogota, Colombia. Mm, well, okay. here, like I think I think my buddy mentioned like there's an, an effort for Tempe too. Like yeah, like cities where you don't have to own a car, you don't have to pay insurance, you don't have to worry about any you know accidents. Like, like I know like there's also the idea of, like closing down streets. Like that's one interesting part of co- what happened during COVID when restaurant when there couldn't, we couldn't have that much indoor dining for obvious reasons. Like expanding, like how like outdoor restaurants, you know, closing down streets for cars, making cities more walkable, building awnings, like you know, like it, it it made the city more lively and also made it more accessible for people who don't own cars. Like that's really great, and it reduces carbon emissions. Like it's like a win-win for everybody, and it doesn't even require that much technology. I agree. I I like the idea, and I was talking to Vaughn about that, about the fact, and I know that Vaughn had mentioned you had really had had talked quite a bit about the future of cities. And, and it's funny that uh, the book that inspired the emergence, it's called the emergence and it's the, uh, the emergent um, capabilities of cities and software. So it's about these decentralized cities and, and creating these cities that are more responsive to the people that are like, you start talking about the amenities within the city and, and, I always think people should have the ability to own their own car. We should never take away the ability. But people like their sport cars. People like to drive. I'm not saying take that away, but you know, in certain pockets of cities, I like the idea of to where if they want to get there and then they drop off the car and then they have easy ways of people movers or, or pods that can get them within the city and then there's walkable. Uh, I, it's, it's, it's a better, it's a better, it's better for, like you said, it's a win-win. It really is. I mean, who wants to walk through traffic? And when you're able to go and shop and see a movie and and be entertained, go to sports, it's just it's it, it seems like it's a better solution for our the future of our our cities. Uh, and, and but the one thing I never want to do is take away the right of somebody to own oh, a car. Well, yeah, you can't ban cars outright. No. You know, like that, yeah, like that's obviously very bad. But you could deprioritize them when it comes to city planning yep. and putting out new policies. Like, for example, like there's a for whenever you're building new apartments, like there are a lot of regulations that stipulate that you have to have like a minimum amount of parking, even if you're building your an apartment like complex right next to like a train station or like a like you have to have any parking that really screws with the design of cities because like spaces that would be devoted to like say a gym to a bar to a library is now being taken up or to even more apartments for more people is being taken off by parking spaces. Absolutely. And, and I think driverless cars will eventually help that because they'll be able to move parking spaces outside of the center of cities. And you're just having these vehicles that are just moving people around. I mean, I don't like the bro culture of Uber, but I, I like Uber. I like, I've never taken a Lyft, but I heard that's good as well. But oh, no, the, I, the idea of just hailing a, a car to take you from one place to another is just freaking brilliant. It's just brilliant. And, and that it's an immediate because based on where people are swarming, <laughs> you just call because taxis were centralized and Uber and Lyft are decentralized. And, you know, the companies aren't necessarily great companies and maybe they will become better companies. And they are, I mean, they're being called, they're being put on the carpet. Uh, Uber is, uh, you know, Travis had bad behavior and you can't have bad behavior. And, and it's a lot harder to operate like that. Um, and, uh, you know, this whole disruption as a, as a buzzword, as opposed to a, a way of, of, of operating and, and holding within the ethics of, you know, cause you know, the idea of disrupting is to take apart. Well, if you have a plan to take apart, but not put it together. <laughs> yeah. Like, it, like you have to build some, in, like rebuild certain institutions. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, exactly. Really yeah. Although yeah. Uber, I, I don't think it should be what the future would try. I think the future should be public transport, but I still think there should be room for Uber. It just shouldn't be 
the what is prioritized by policymakers. Well, people should be able to have vouchers for Uber, right? So uh, the public should be able to issue vouchers where they cannot have to pay for it. You're kind of redistributing. The taxes are paying for it, but it's actually then helping people move about a city so they can have better expressions of their labor, right? Right. right. But I feel like that money would be better spent by expanding like public transportation infrastructure. Because like you like the money that you that you put out that you earmark for like vouchers can just be used to expand the lines to like, increase the quality like whether the speed like I don't know it's it's not like the, the same problem I have with school vouchers like you know the how people get into private school like that money could be better spent like on I don't know just bettering the men- amenities in public schools like you know it's it's like it feels like it's a- it's kind of like asset stripping but for government you know. Like privatization, like I'm not too much of a big fan of that either. Well, but it is, it is. So let's think about this. The vouchers are public. It's public funds. Because, see, this is a thing that I it's always have. Like, fun, a, it's public funds, but you're giving it to somebody who's like not really accountable to the public so much. At least, well, like, they are they because they're, well, okay. So you're saying that, well, yeah, but what's the difference between giving somebody a welfare check and giving them ability to use, uh, whether it's public transportation or it's private transportation for public means. I, that's, see, that's, that's a, sometimes that, that's like the centralized where everybody has to be on a train. Yeah, well, there's a difference between like an individual and giving money to an individual and giving money to like a corporation. <laughs> see, and that's where I break down. I, I really do because uh, you're giving it to a corporation, but the corporation is providing a public benefit. Right, but it's like so can individuals like, like I don't know, like when I like I'm thinking of it's also like in terms of like Keynesian economics, like by spending giving somebody money, like they're also sent, it's money that they're spending on the local economy, putting money into it, like they're still helping, like you know they're still stimulating things, but like for love for money for vouchers, like for ride com- ride sharing companies or for private schools, good. like I, I don't know, it kind of feels like it also feels like rent seeking, kind of, and like they do provide value, but I feel like it's like a the money should be coming from like private stars rather than public source, you know? Yeah. See, and I like the idea of, of private, um, you know, the vouchers for um, charter schools. And I know there's bad implementations of, of charter schools, but I, I have a friend who runs a, a charter school and, and just like there's bad implementations of public schools, there's a lot of bad implementations of public schools. And so that's the thing about this. It's the same thing about the sober house is that we're giving money to the sober house so that they can take care of people. Um, and, you know, as opposed to, you know, so is it better to go to a public because these are public, these are public institutions. So is the argument that it's the, the better use of funds to go to public institutions than to private institutions for public uses? I mean, that's the, yeah, that's like the in, breakdown. I think in the case of public transport, I'd say yes. Like, like, I don't know, like the whole, like, cause I, I'm thinking of some of the terms like the reducing car, like carbon emissions and also improving the design of cities, like, Reducing car usage is kind of my priority. Reducing car usage without, you know, outright banning it. Like that's like kind of what my priority is. So if it's, so if it's going towards something that say provides accessibility to car policy board or reduces the incentive for getting one, then yeah, I think it's a good idea. Well, um, yeah. And so, and then I actually had a little bit of a dis- debate with somebody on Facebook before on this is that really what is the difference? Because if you have these pods that are driverless that are roaming the city and they're being used for public use, what is the difference between these group of pods and a train? Because the train is re- requiring ripping up internal city streets as opposed to these pods being able to work as as a as a thread you know they can be collectively uh, connected and chained together or they can roam individually so what's the difference between somebody being able to use that as a private use or a public use through vouchers and that's uh, you're not the only one that I've, I've debated this on because it's it's something that i'm trying to in the eyes of the emergence really wrap my brain around yeah i'm glad you actually uh, i'm actually glad you asked that because like for one like public transport whether like buses and uh, trains like use space more and energy more efficiently than say just giving everybody like their own car or like like ride sharing like i'm gonna send you like this link like it's a it's a very famous one like in the circle like they're in planning circles that i run around but make sure to open it too because it'll okay. show you like the diff like the difference like in size like in space between like car individual cars and a your average city bus is this is a human transit yeah, like it, okay, it's, yeah, yeah. It's human transit. And click on it. Yeah, I'll read that. Look at, the, look at the very. You don't have to read it then. Let's look at the very first photo. Yeah. Compare the first one and the third one, and the second one's like the amount of people. Yes. Yeah, I I, I get what you're talking about. Yeah, like and... some people think like oh, ripping up in like say the space within like, it's bad, but 
look at how much space like the like all these cars take up to transport like that small amount of people. Yeah, right. but the thing is with with pods, they wouldn't they wouldn't be distributed the same way. Uh, well, I guess they would to in some theory, degree. I, I see. In what theory, you're they yeah. wouldn't, but in practice, they are. You know, or look at how many lanes are opened up, expanded on the highway every other year. Yeah, you only expand like the lanes so much. All it does like it just increase congestion. Like look at the new two hundred two. Like it's just as bad as everything. Yeah. Like as uh, everything was like earlier. So, and I know Vaughn had this, this argument too, is that, so put everybody in buses and trains and, and I like the idea of trains. Trust me. I like the idea of light rail, but I, you know, this individual versus the collective of putting people into these collective, you know, larger pods. Uh, I, 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 you know, I'm glad you sent me this image because I will read through this and I'll think about it, but it's, it's, and, and I know this, this idea about putting people in large high rise towers as opposed to individual homes. And I know you've got to get off in a little bit, so we'll continue this later. I'm not even going to go into the other topic I was talking about. We'll, we'll start to wrap this up, but this will be great to really think about in future conversations is that, you know, is it better for society to go and, and be, put us in apartment complexes and larger units and, and, and trains and buses or is it better for us to live in smaller pods and and transport in smaller pods as individuals or is it better for us to be in communities and collectives and 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 you know i, I think about the stalinist uh you know the you know, the big those, apartment like, complex yeah you're thinking and, yeah you're thinking of like for example like in rion's or yaroslav like mm, no like i don't think into it like the pub, like the more public oriented arrangements like necessarily like the antithesis of individual you can still be an individualist and ride public transport and ride and you have your own apartment, you know? Well, you end up yeah. more people to live. You know, like, I don't know, it's, it's just there's an obsession like, here in the States about owning a home and owning your own car, you know? Like being the master of your own fate. Which, sure, but like, it, like individually, not too bad, but like, like the more people do that, like, you know, at least like more negative, like socially negative. Well, yeah. And I, and personally, see, I'm not a, I'm not a real, Vaughn's an extremely social person. I'm an antisocial person. I'm not a real big people person. I'm into myself and tell, ask anybody who knows me. So I like the idea of my own space. I don't like, I've never liked living in an apartment. I just, and you know, but probably like you say, I mean, that's, that's me being a little bit selfish, but I, you know, if I'm going to work my life and I'm going to express my labor, I really want to have the ability to then take the rewards of my labor and live the life that I want to live, whether it's on a farm or a, you know, I, I don't want to have to be put into a community or a commune um, because that's greater for society. And this is a hardcore topic when we think about this, right? Is that the future of our cities, the future of our labor? Is it is it better for society the way that our labor is, you know, is that what we're going to build is the expression of our value of our labor to serve society? just to serve society or is it to serve ourselves with society? And that's a, that's a very deep question, right? Yeah. Like it's like, should the public take priority Should the private take my priority? I think like it's possible to have a synthesis of both. Yeah. Yeah. No, like, like the state is like, it's like, I don't see like, I'm not like a, you like, you know, we, you and Vaughn both are like, I'm not like really a Reagan-esque guy, Reagan-esque guy who thinks like, Oh, the government is not the solution to the problem. Government is the problem. No, like it's a useful tool. Like, I think like like in my ideal world, like all like all types of housing would be available. Just like I'd say, like government priority should be given to like social, like I guess like social. Housing. But you still have the option to buy home, of home the countryside if you want to. Or like like one I'd city that I, in America that I think is like better than most like urban planning wise is like, I think it's like Dallas, like Dallas Fort Worth area. Okay, you know, like like because housing regulations aren't that stringent there. Like so you can have like there's a lot more high rises being built, but at the same time there's also like the outs urban sprawl isn't too bad like phoenix where it stretches from one yeah yeah, yeah 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 but like yeah you can if you want to buy a suburban house if you want to go ahead if you want to buy a say like an apartment downtown that's also fine like you know like have options for those but prioritize one like you don't like don't ban single family zoning but single family houses but at the same time don't prioritize it by zoning by zone, through zoning laws that only allow single family homes to be built like I for example, you. like okay. there's a reason yep. like there's no such thing as, as high rises in Avondale, you know, like the zoning law doesn't allow it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I like and that, Mesa doesn't either, but there's one in there, <laughs> the, yeah, the, the Western that, Savings Building. Yeah, yeah, the like one, that, savings. one got the one that got through before the law came down and locked everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, no, I like, get what you're talking about. I, yeah, I, like, I and that's like one example, like a free, like say, like the individual freedom of like the real estate owner to like build an apartment if he wants to or not. 
yeah. But yeah, like like have options for both if you want to own single family. Home, like do it. Like do so. Just don't block the ability to build like mul- like multi family like or multi apartment ho- like homes. Yeah. Like says. Yeah. Or there's people who don't even allow duplexes to be built. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. No. And then some of these zoning laws are just insane. Believe oh, me. Oh yeah. Like God. The, literally, I can. You can have an entire podcast just on California's like ridiculous laws. Yeah. Yeah. Like or there's like there's a there's a state center that like me and like my circle really like his name like Scott Wiener, but every like a lot of people in California hate him for wanting to build like more like high rises near public transit facilities and getting rid of parking minimums. People. If you ever want to piss off somebody who lives in the city, like piss off somebody, like just tell them to get rid of minimum, like parking minimums. Oh yeah. Car car owners really love parking minimums, but it's bad for society overall. It's because it's just like the obligate, you're obligating a property owner to build a parking lot. Like even if they don't want to, or they'll have the resources to do that. Like that's an example, like of their, I got you for businesses to have that, that that, the the permitting requires a minimum amount of parking spaces per, per retail site or business site. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, like that, that. That's pretty dumb. Like, if they want to build parking or not, let them. Like, it's their choice. <laughs> like, yeah, it makes you sound libertarian, but I'm like, like, like zoning regulations, parking regulations. Like, like those are examples of regulations that are used to capture like aspects of like the economy or society. Well, I was up in Sedona and yesterday, and and there was just absolutely no parking. But thank God, you you know, it's close enough where you can walk around. But trying to get you know within two or three miles, it was just impossible. So if you had people movers and you had you know like trolley systems and things like that, uh, but of course the zoning in Sedona is not going to allow for rails. I can guarantee you, because that would throw the whole dynamic off. And that's I guess that's the idea about sometimes with light rail and trains can actually really kind of tear apart a community a little bit, possibly. I can't see Sedona having a rail system. And it's it's not for everybody, of course. No, I think it's like something for like the bigger cities. Yeah. So, you know, all these conversations, you know, uh, we'll wrap it up here. All these conversations we're talking about and the value of labor. And and, uh, we we extended beyond that a little bit with transportation, climate change and and these things. But they all talk about the ideas behind the emergence, which is to, you know, look at ideas. It's not about creating solutions necessarily, but to put positive ideas and theories and, and listen. You know, the emergences are not about telling it's about listening and you know people like you and especially the gen x uh gen gen zers uh you know and what your thoughts are you're just right out of of college and you're you're facing a future here and and i really appreciate you coming on the show carlos and i i've always yeah. enjoyed talking to you and you're very deep and and always brought apart a lot of a lot of facts you've sent me a lot of links by the way in the show i'm going to include all these links in the show so people can access them and, and please ask me any questions and and yeah. uh so so uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show and I know you're going to have a very, very good future ahead of you. Yep. And, uh, and we'll have you on the show sometime again, if you'd like, and we can dig into some of these other ideas. Yeah. Thank you. And likewise, like, like it's been really enjoyable to have conversations with you too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So hang on the show afterwards real quick and I'll say goodbye, but right now I'm just going to sign off the show and thank you everybody for listening to the emergence and we'll talk to you soon.